Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here. Sorry about the delay. We um, um, just wanted to make sure that the keynotes uh, slide deck was ready to go. So uh, it is, and I um, just want to say welcome. My name is Pat Renard, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Enrollment Services here at St. Petersburg College. And on behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Jamel Connor, who's in the back, Jamel waved everybody, we would like to welcome you to our fifth annual Moving the Needle Conference. We thank you for your attendance. Um, we know that there are many conferences to choose from and that for some of you, travel budgets are lean and we're humbled that you uh, would cho choose our conference. Thank you for your engagement in the process of student success, which as you know, is a rewarding yet never-ending journey. In the first few years of this conference, we focused on how institutions could change their data culture to help make better informed decisions with the goal of increasing student success. This was and, continu and continues to be critically important work for if we're not looking at the same data across our institution or there's a lack of trust in the data, initiatives are doomed to fail. Last year, we kind of changed the direction of the conference, and the theme was more um, student, about student engagement and persistence, and we used the framework of the American Association of Community Colleges Academic Pathways Movement, and we transformed the conference from a conference about how to change your, your institution's data culture to more about student engagement. And so this year's conference will continue to explore student engagement as we dive into the role we as educators have in helping to support our students with care and innovation. Many of our students are facing issues today that students a generation ago, by and large, did not face. More and more students are struggling with getting their basic needs met, which obviously negatively impacts their ability to reach their potential. And many of the sessions today and tomorrow will share strategies on how to assi assist these students who are in, uh, struggling to meet their needs. Uh, these problems require innovative solutions and new ways of doing business. Uh, the conference planning committee has been hard at work since January planning this event, and it is our sincere hope that you find the content meaningful and relevant to your work. I am personally excited about what I'm going to learn uh, there are so many great presentations scheduled for the next two days that I think you're going to find it difficult to choose which ones to attend. We have intentionally kept this as a relatively small conference with the idea that you can connect and share ideas with the colleagues who are fighting the same fight that you are. I'm also proud of the fact that we've been able to keep our conference registration fee the same for the last four years. At this time, I want to uh, pay a special thank you to all of our sponsors, without whom we could not put on a conference like this. You will have the opportunity to hear from many of the sponsors throughout the conference. This year, we are pleased to have a trio of sponsors who have teamed together to be our title sponsors, Microsoft, Discourse Analytics, and Campus Management. Please give them a round of applause. We have two gold level sponsors this year. We have FATV, which we've recently partnered with, and we have SWIM, who we have um, done a lot of work with over the years. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> this year we have six silver sponsors. We have Ed Financial Services, Grad Guru, High Point, Apex Office Supplies, Campus Speak, and Tutor.com. Please give them a round of applause as well. And we're thankful for High Point, Grad Guru, and Tutor.com who sponsored breakfast this morning. And lastly, we have our bronze sponsors, Kaltura and the Florida College Access Network, as well as some individual sponsors, Nysad and IDEA. Our sponsors help offset the cost of the conference, and we could not do this without their generous support. The sponsors have tables in the lobby, so please stop by and talk to the representatives from these fabulous companies and organizations. They all do great work supporting our institutions and the students we serve. At this time, I want to quickly recognize and thank our keynote presenters. We are fortunate to have so many powerful keynotes this year. 
In just a few minutes, you will hear from our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn, who is the interim vice president and academic uh, vice president of academic and student affairs and professor of urban education at Lemoyne Owen College in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Strayhorn is a former fa former faculty member at the Ohio State University, and he's an internationally recognized student success scholar and the author of the book College Su College Students' Sense of Belonging a key for educational success for all students. If you've never heard Dr. Strayhorn present before, you are in for a treat. And for those of you who have heard Dr. Strayhorn, you know that you're about to experience a very powerful and engaging message. <clears throat> Today after lunch, Dr. Tanja Williams, uh, my president and the president of St. Petersburg College will share her experience growing up and how she needed mentors to stand in the gap for her. She will describe how traditional support systems aren't enough and how we have to think and partner differently to meet the needs of our most at-risk students. I can stand before you and honestly say that I've never met anyone more passionate about the welfare of students. And I'm not just saying that because she's my president. You'll see. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Josh Weiner, the founder and executive director of the College Excellence Program at the Aspen Institute, will deliver a keynote describing how moving students from high school and beyond and beyond underemployment to a quality post-secondary credential and a good job requires moving beyond traditional measures of access, retention, and completion, and requires that we cultivate stronger partnerships with K-12, universities, employers, community-based organizations. I think we all know that we cannot do this work alone, and it truly does take a village. And then tomorrow afternoon, closing this conference, is Dr. Russell Lowry Hart, the president of Amarillo College. Dr. Lowry Hart will present his keynote entitled, Addressing Poverty as a Disruption to Save Higher Education. As I prepared for this conference, immersing myself in the literature around the topic of meeting students' basic needs, it did not take long for me to, to begin reading about Amarillo College and the pioneering work that they are doing in this field. Dr. Lowry Hart was a presenter at the conference last year, and it was an easy choice for the planning committee to invite him as a keynote this year. At this time, I'd just like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, first and most importantly, where are the restrooms? So um, if you go out these doors, and ladies, you would take a right, and the restrooms are on the right. And men, you would take a left, and the uh, restrooms are on the left. <clears throat> so uh, if you've got a question about where a session is, uh, you have uh, an agenda. And I think it's on page 14 and 15. There are maps of the campus uh, in your program. Um, how do you get from one building to another? First of all, you're only going to be in two buildings over the no next uh, day or two days. This building, which is the University Partnership Building and the Conference Center. Uh, for those of you that had breakfast and registered this morning, uh, that's the Conference Center. Uh, we will have hosts along the sidewalk, so uh, you, you really can't get lost. Um, how do I know where the next session is? Uh, you've got the program, and then outside each uh, breakout or concurrent uh, session room is the schedule for that room. We also have monitors. Uh, who will uh, uh, announce what uh, conference sessions are next. And if uh, you have additional questions, we have an information table right outside to the left here. And also, we have an information table uh, in the conference center. We also have conference volunteers. Um, they are wearing blue t-shirts. You can't miss them. So if you're not around at the information table, uh, if you have a question, you can always ask one of the conference volunteers. So uh, all of the keynotes, we have four, as I just described. They will be in this room. We call this the digitorium. Um, all of the concurrent sessions are in this building. A, a few of them are in this room. Um, many of them are in adjacent rooms in this building, uh, right outside, either to the left or to the right, as you exit this room. And then uh, where are the meals and uh, the evening reception? So all of the meals in the reception tonight, which is sponsored by Microsoft uh, Campus Management and Discourse Analytics, uh, uh, the meals are in the conference center. 
Um, so uh, we really hope that you will join us at 5.30 for uh, a great evening reception. We'll have live music and uh, hors d'oeuvres, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, um, this is the second year that we've held the conference uh, at, at one of our campuses. Uh, you're now on the Seminole campus. Uh, it's one of five full-service campuses and one of 11 learning sites at St. Petersburg College. Please explore the campus during the event. We will provide a campus tour uh, at the uh, end of lunch today, and we'll make an announcement towards the end of lunch so that you can do that and still not miss uh, the next keynote. Um, I want to quickly say thank you to the provost of the Seminole campus, Mark Strickland. I see Mark in the back. I'd like to give Mark and his team a round of applause. <laughs> Mark, we could, not admit, we could not have done this uh, without you and your team. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think Mark was also responsible for the weather. Uh, Jonathan Sullivan, yeah, Jonathan Sullivan is our uh, technology expert. He, he oversees the Digitorium. He's up in the booth. Today happens to be his birthday, so let's give him a, ha a round of applause. Uh, we will have book signings after Dr. Strayhorn's uh, keynote address this morning, um, and then again tomorrow uh, after Josh Weiner's keynote, we will have books available for sale, and both are, have agreed to graciously be available to sign books if that's something you want to do. So who's, oh, a little bit more housekeeping. We do have um, uh, Wi-Fi, if you're not already connected, uh, it's free. Just uh, scan and you'll see guest Wi-Fi. There is no password required. You just need to accept the terms and conditions and then uh, hop right on. Um, we also would appreciate it if you would, uh, if you're on social media, if you would uh, join the conversation, post uh, using the hashtag MTM conference and uh, We'd appreciate that. If you've got comments or questions or pictures, uh, we'd love for you to do that. And for those of you that would like to um, download the event app, it's Drifta. You can get that from your Apple Store or Google Play Store. Uh, that would allow you to uh, uh, view the agenda. If, uh, you could create your own uh, schedule and then connect with other attendees. And uh, your feedback's important. So last year uh, at the conference, and I think every year, we've had um, paper surveys. This year, we have a digital survey that's available via text uh, or uh, with this URL. And at the conclusion of each uh, session, there'll be a room monitor that will provide this and, and encourage you to uh, rate the session and give us feedback for next year. So who is here? Let's talk about. Um, Who's here this year? So we have about 225 uh, roughly uh, attendees, obviously many from colleges and universities. We have sponsors. We also have several from uh, local community-based organizations given the theme of this year's uh, conference. We do have 15 sponsors. Again, we're grateful for their uh, contributions and, and for their participation this year. We have 38 different colleges and universities attending this year from 14 different states and Canada, so we're excited about that. You see a high concentration, of course, in Florida, uh, and then you see where, where else um, from across the country in Canada people are coming from. We have 14 of the 28 uh, state colleges or community colleges represented in Florida. There are 28 um, colleges that make up the Florida college system, so we're grateful to have so many of our sister institutions at the conference this year. And then we have a lot of uh, influencers, influencers and policy decision makers here, and so we're grateful for that. We have over 70 that have the title of uh, president, vice president, uh, chancellor, executive uh, vice chancellor, or executive director. So we're grateful for that. And we also have uh, 30 attendees who are deans or uh, chairs or faculty, and uh, they are our classroom student engagers, and we're very pleased that, they, uh, that you are here this morning. So we wanted to give a shout out to the school that has sent the most number of employees. So, yeah. so Prince George's Community College from, uh, yeah, from Largo, Maryland, sent nine employees. So uh, 
thank you for entrusting us with, uh, with your time and your, your money. <laughs> and then we also wanted to um, uh, recognize those that traveled the furthest. There were two that traveled over 3,000 miles to be here. Yeah, so we have Keanu College from Alberta, Canada. Um, and then we also have Lane Community College from Eugene, Oregon. So let's give them a round of applause. So when you registered, uh, you should have received a conference program, a lanyard, and a pen. We intentionally kept the swag materials to a minimum this year. The planning committee decided to forego some of the conference swag in lieu of helping students. And actually, I'd like to thank Apex Office Products, one of our sponsors, for contributing both the lanyards and the pens that you have uh, received this morning. So let's give Apex a round of applause. This year, we set aside 30% of the registration fees collected for a student emergency fund that will be used to assist St. Pete College students in crisis. Uh, that's why you did not get a conference bag or another portfolio to add to your collection in your closet at home. We anticipate that we will be able to add uh, uh, over $10,000 to this emergency fund this year. And tomorrow, at the conclusion of the conference, I'll provide you the actual dollar amount. I'm now going to shift gears a little bit and share a little bit of data before Dr. Strayhorn delivers his keynote. Uh, this slide shows, the, for four-year colleges, the 150% of time graduation rates based on acceptance rates at the institution. So I think we're, we're probably all very familiar with how we measure graduation rates with our full-time, first-time in college cohorts. So that's what this is representing. As you can see, the more selective the university is in their admissions, the higher the graduation rate and vice versa. I believe that when you uh, hear Dr. Williams later today, she may mention how we are trying to create a community of care for all students, whether it's a student at the top of their class admitted to a college who only admits 25% or fewer of their applicants, or whether, whether they are a student who for a myriad of reasons attend an open admissions college. We can argue and or complain about the IPED's definition of the graduation rate and how it excludes certain student groups or how uh, some schools may manipulate their fall FTIC cohort by admitting in the summer or delaying until the spring. But to me, that's a fool's errand. It's a metric and it's applied the same way consistently across the country. This shows that we must do better. This slide shows a trend line of graduation rates with 150% of normal time for graduation for two-year colleges. So the percent of students that uh, started full-time FTIC for a two-year degree that graduated in three years, it's somewhere between 30 and 35%. That's the first thing I notice. It's not good. Second thing I notice is that over the course of 14 years, we really haven't moved the needle. There's a lot of work to be done to make this, uh, to improve this uh, metric. This is the same uh, piece of data for four-year colleges. So uh, those that graduate within six years from a four-year university, uh, and it's hovering between 50 and 60 percent. And again, over the course of 14 years, we really haven't made much progress in moving the needle. I think we can all agree that we have work to do to improve these statistics, and I think we can all agree that it's not easy work. We have an obligation to those we serve to do better. Our students are counting on us. Secondary, secondarily and increasingly, our budgets are dependent on moving the needle with retention and completion. By show of hands, how many of you represent a college where part of your overall funding is based on your college's performance? Yeah, most of us. Of those, how many have retention and or completion as a metric used to measure your institution's performance? Right, yep, most of us. At St. Petersburg College and in the state of Florida, we're in a system where the, there are four factors used to measure our performance funding. The first is job placement and continue edu continuing education. 
how well we do uh, uh, with our AS degree seeking students when they complete and our certificate uh, students when they complete in terms of landing the job. And then how well do we do in terms of transferring our AA graduates onto a baccalaureate program. I'll tell you that St. Pete College does a very good job with this metric. We're at the, at the top there. The second metric is entry level wages. So how well do our students do in terms of getting a job and, and are they now earning a sustainable wage? And I'll tell you, St. Pete College does a great job there. But the third one is retention. And we've got a lot of work to do in retention. And the fourth one is completion and we have a lot of work to do in completion. So we don't have a magic bullet. We're in this together and uh, we need each other to improve these, these numbers. This uh, last piece of data I'm gonna share, I was uh, hesitant to share it, uh, but I decided to share it anyway. It's um, a little bit of airing our dirty laundry, but I look at it this way. If I was chronically sick and I had an illness, um, I could choose to try to fix it myself or I could choose to go to a doctor and, and uh, seek treatment and surround myself with others that are going through or have gone through the same illness and, tr and uh, try to help me. So I'm sharing it in the, in the spirit of transparency and trying to improve our processes. So what this is looking at is uh, our students who were here in the fall term that did not come back in the spring term. So let me define that fall cohort a little bit. And you see we've got uh, four years of data there. Um, these are students that were seeking a credential. So they're not here just taking a, a one course as a non-credit student. They're seeking a degree or a college level certificate. They are in good standing academically. They have a 2.0, many of them have a, over a 3.0 GPA. If they're receiving financial aid, um, they're in good uh, satisfactory academic progress with financial aid. And there are no disciplinary issues. And you can see that um, in uh, fall of 2013 to spring of 14, we lost uh, 1,857 students that did not come back. In fall of 14, we had a state this, some legislative changes in the state of Florida, and this really rocked us a little bit in terms of the numbers of students that started in the fall that did not come back in the spring. So we've gradually chipped away at that over the last three years. It is very tough, hard work to do. Um, I will tell you that when we uh, do the analysis, about 30% of these students do come back to us within a, a year's time, but 70% um, do not. So somehow, whether it's um, work, uh, finances, life, uh, that they did not come back. So you know, we've got a lot of work to do in this area. Uh, before I uh, turn it over to um, uh, campus management, who's going to introduce our keynote, I would like for Jonathan to show a short video that I think will uh, set some context for the keynote. So many people have played such a big role in my education. I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for those people helping me out in my journey to become an engineer. Because the campuses are so well maintained, it makes it very easy to, to focus and it makes it very easy to, to sit and relax and actually learn. When I come to class, I feel like I belong, like I'm, I'm part of a team. Everyone that's there is happy to be there. And then usually those people I work with, they're, they're more involved and, and that creates a better atmosphere and I feel like I learn better because of that. I'm from Vietnam, so I'm an international student here. And when I come here, everything is not so hard for me because everybody are willing to help me and make me feel welcome and feel like home. A couple compliments I would have for a majority of my teachers and professors is that they're very lenient and they are very understanding of things and they know that life happens. I would like to thank the advisors, the professors, tutors, and the accessibility advisors. They really made me feel like I'm just more than just a student. I am actually a somebody, not just a statistic that I am a student trying to you know, graduate. 
and be great. I just want to thank everybody for helping me feel like I can accomplish my goal and helping others accomplish theirs. I want to thank you all the teachers who helped me to get into the atmosphere in here. You guys are amazing and I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for you. So, yeah. Obviously, this is a video with St. Petersburg College students singing the praises of St. Petersburg College. Uh, I'm sure that each institution represented in the room has something similar, a similar video or other marketing collateral. And the point is not to be self-serving to SPC, but to demonstrate that the students who thrive and the students who seem just a little bit more determined, driven, and focused are usually the ones that have connected with somebody on campus. They know that someone knows their name and that someone cares, that someone would notice if they stopped attending, that someone said something or offered a helping hand just at the right moment that changed the trajectory of that student's life. Our words and our actions matter, perhaps more than we think they do. There's a proverb that says, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. To me, when I think about that, I think about a picture of a sculpture, rather, of golden apples maybe set in a silver bowl. And it's a beautiful picture, perhaps a calming or inviting picture. The right encouraging word or action spoken or done at the right time can be a life-changing and beautiful experience for a student. That's the message of this video, and that is the culture we are desperately trying to spread like wildfire. Okay, enough from me. I now want to invite Renee Pacini from Campus Management to the stage who will introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. Renee is the Director of Product Marketing at Campus Management, one of our title sponsors. Campus Management provides cloud-based solutions that help higher education institutions engage and empower students, improve student success, and work more efficiently to deliver the services and support students need to flourish. A 2018 Microsoft Global Education Partner of the Year, Campus Management provides transformative technologies to more than 1,000 institutions in 30 countries, helping students across the globe realize the power of education. Renee? Good morning. You know, it's really not fair to show a video like that to a mom of a recent graduate and a son still in college right before I come up. But um, seriously, if my company through technology can help all of you create those videos, we're successful and we're happy because that's really what we're trying to do. Dr. Terrell Strayhorn is founding chief executor of Do Good Work Educational Consulting. He also serves as interim vice president of academic and student affairs and Professor of Urban Education at Lemoyne Owen College in Memphis, Tennessee. Previously, Dr. Strayhorn was on the faculty at The Ohio State University, where he served as Professor and Director of the Center for Higher Education Enterprise. An internationally recognized student success scholar and a foremost authority on issues of equity and diversity, Dr. Strayhorn is author of over 10 books and more than 200 book chapters, journal articles, and other scholarly publications. His most popular book, College Students' Sense of Belonging, A Key to Educational Success, sold record copies nationally, and its second edition will debut in September of 2018. Dr. Strayhorn received a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, a master's degree in educational policy from the Curry School of Education at UVA, and doctorate in higher education from Virginia Tech. He is currently pursuing a graduate certificate in biblical studies from Fuller Theological Seminary. He is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, several honor societies, including Phi, Phi Kappa Phi, and a proud native of Virginia Beach, Virginia. Dr. Strayhorn. All right, good morning, and round of applause to Renee for that wonderful introduction, please. It is my great pleasure to be here, back here, and to have the opportunity to address a wonderful audience today about a really, really important uh, set of questions and topics that 
really will, I hope, steer and guide what will happen over the next day or two days at the Moving the Needle conference. Uh, this is my second time, at least, back at St. Petersburg College Seminole Campus, and it's also my second time at this really, really cool stage. Um, and so I just want to say a couple of thanks to folks for the opportunity to come back, and then I want to jump into what I want to share. I want to offer a couple of thoughts that will add on to what's already been said, and a lot has already been said, I think, really resonates with my message to you today. But before I go too far, please, uh, round of applause to Dr. Renard for that wonderful uh, introduction and set of comments, as well as the video. It's always good to hear you speak, and you have the language of belonging down. So I guess the next keynote on belonging you could give for me in my stead. Um, also to Dr. Tashika Griffith in the back, if you'll just stand for folks and wave your hands, clap for my friend and my colleague, Dr. Griffith, who uh, serves as provost of the campuses here in the state of Florida. I do want to say special thanks to Dr. Strickland, who's somewhere in the room. Is he somewhere around? Um, okay, well, we'll just clap for him in his absence. <laughs> The reason why is, I mean, not only is he the provost of the Seminole campus, but he's done something really, really wonderful uh, for me twice now. Um, and that is that when I asked about, I don't know how many of you were here the last time I was here, but um, right as I was about to leave, and I think uh, I was getting into maybe Tashika's car and we were about to go to the airport, he came running and said, don't leave, I've got something for you. And he gave me the best gift ever because if you know anything about me, there are two things that I really, really love, well, probably three things I really love. One is eyeglasses. Secondly, I love bow ties. Third, I love cool socks. And so he gave me a pair of socks. And I remember two weeks ago, I live in Memphis now, so I was walking along the water with a friend, and I told him I'm going to St. Petersburg in a couple of weeks. And they said, well, have you ever been there before? I said, yeah, this is my second time going back. I said, the last time I went, oh, it was so cool. The provost, Mark, gave me a pair of socks. You know what? I'm going to wear those socks when I go back in a couple of weeks. And then that was two weeks ago and life happened and I forgot about the socks and so Mark gave me my second pair of socks so that's really cool I got two pair of St. Petersburg socks now um, and so I do want to say special thanks for that um, all right so what I want to share this morning um, about belonging is sort of might be a little bit of belonging 101 uh, for folks, but I actually want to try to go a bit further down the road with our discussion for a couple of reasons. One, uh, if you listened to the opening segment, not just the data, but the words, the phrases, certainly that video, then you already have been introduced to the concept of belonging, the spirit of belonging, I hope you can see, as even Renee and her uh, comments sort of um, affirmed for us, the power that belonging has. I mean, you can't really watch a video. I mean, you could, but I couldn't watch that video and not feel something. So in a few slides, um, I'll go very quickly over that one because belonging is a feeling. And that's what makes my social scientist friends so frustrated with my research sometimes is it feels, it's about feelings and it's about mindsets and it's about um, affective dimensions and people who want data to be hard and firm and objective and not uh, connected to our sensory, sensory of uh, our sensories, you know, are frustrated when people hold data up and then start to interpret it in or through an affective lens. I don't think you can talk about um, care and innovation and moving the needle and student success without bringing these two to bear on our work. Our work is at all times objective and subjective. Our work is at all times um, feelings and data and reports and strategy and planning, but none of that makes any sense at all if at the end of it, students don't feel like people care about them. Or as was mentioned, uh, you can spend all the money in the world on cool swag, all the money in the world on impressive, um, high-ranked and tenured faculty who are teaching in amazing facilities like this. But if students come into this space and feel like one in the number, no one knows my name. All they want is my money. 
I loved it because it's, it's what I talk about in the book, you know, that they could pick up, walk out of the classroom, and no one would even realize they were gone. Then they will always leave. So too would we, by the way. Imagine working in a place where you felt like if you packed up and moved your office tomorrow, no one would even, it'd take five weeks before anyone said, what happened to Terrell, is he still here? <laughs> because when we don't have those strong bonds of connection um, that really drive or build upon the other efforts around strategy and planning and minimization of cost, without those strong bonds, then most, much of what we're doing in higher education will fail. So I want to offer some of those insights. I want to move us down the road a bit further in the conversation. And then I want to stop um, and allow us opportunity to engage after this for the book signing and, and sort of uh, reception outside this building. And um, certainly, if we have time, I will uh, pause for a few questions at the end. Okay, so when I thought about our goal for today, if you're a person, by the way, who's on social media, I've already put a post out there. There are several others probably from my uh, the Duga Work uh, team. If you want to follow me on social media, it's TL Strayhorn uh, for myself. It's Do Good Work for the consulting firm. And then if you are interested in longer conversation, than what the Q&A will allow or probably even time outside for a book signing would allow. Just take a picture of this slide. You can shoot me an email. If you shoot an email to this when I get back to my email and have an opportunity to respond, I will respond. If it's an easy thing like, hey, could I have slide five? I'll just get slide five sent to you or I'll send it back to you. Or if it's a long question, like I once gave a talk in the past couple of months at a conference for the deaf and hard of hearing. It was a wonderful experience. And at the end, um, you know, my interpreter who gave me the permission to share the story, because it's a fascinating story, uh, question, but it's one that took me forever to write back to on email. My interpreter was a white male, and my interpreter wrote me and said, as he's a tall white male, I don't know if you know this, but I'm not tall. I'm not white either, by the way, um, but, but I am male. I do identify as male, so I, w w one out of the three. And he said to me on email, he said, hey, I have a question. Have you ever thought about the fact that as a fun-sized African-American male, what it means, real, real talk, right? That's what he said. So he said, have you ever thought about what it means for a tall white male to interpret your words for the audience? How does that shape the message that the deaf and hard of hearing community hears when the vessel that they're looking at is so dramatically different than the vessel that's delivering the message? I see lots of nods and I hear some mm-hmmms like I'm in church, so I know. It, it's one of those questions where it's like marvelous, but oh my gosh, I had to think through it and then I had to craft a response. You know how it is, you hit delete on the first response and type it all over because you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, so if you have a question like that, it may take me a little bit more time than usual to respond, but I am uh, committed to trying to respond to as many questions that you might have that we don't get to in the session. Now, so as a way of sort of uh, pushing us down the road, I start with a really, I think, existential question not because I want to be obtuse, but because I want to be m far more provocative in how we're thinking about this as a conference. By the way, we're at a conference. Conference, by definition, is a gathering of like-minded people. I want you to look around, look to the person to your right or left. Though they may be different from you, we are like-minded. That's what brought us to this room. All we put out was one sign called Moving the Needle Conference, and it brought us all from Oregon all the way down to the state of Florida, brought a whole nine group of a, a nine uh, person cohort from a single campus. We all came here because Move the Needle brought us to this space. So a conference is a gathering of like-minded people over an extended period of time. That period of time might sometimes be long minutes, long hours, a couple of days. You ever been to a conference that just won't stop? This that lasts about a week or two long. Um, so it's a, it's a gathering of like-minded people over an extended period of time. But listen to this, the conference, uh, the textbook definition of the word conference, according to most collegiate dictionaries has two purposes. A conference exists to, for, to bring us together so that we can have spirited conversation, debate, and differences, and ultimately reach consensus. That is, we got to agree to some stuff. We have to be honest in order to have that conversation. That's why I so appreciate the data. That second slide that we don't want to share, but we have to get, we have to build, uh, you know, evidence-based uh, cultures require 
honest sharing of information. What we're doing is we're building cultures where evidence is shared, not just good evidence, good data, but accurate data about where we are. One of the things that I find most exciting about the job I have right now at my current institution is that I get to help build that culture and I get to change a culture that has not for a long time been honest with itself. And by the way, my institution's not by itself. Most of us are not that way. No one ever wants to put out, hey, by the way, 50% of our students drop out. I don't know if you know this, but two thirds of our students say that they don't belong on our campus. That's the stuff we want to hold on to. We don't want publicized. We want to work on that, but we want to celebrate that one third of our students are first generation. Now, we didn't say anything about how those first generation students feel about their experience. We didn't say anything about their success rates, but one third of, of college students at our campuses might be first generation, which, by the way, is true across the nation. And those numbers are remarkably growing, growing at a remarkable pace. So part of our conversation is to realize we're here to reach consensus, to agree to some stuff. But the second objective of a conference is to bring us together so we can change. Um, you know, prior to this conference, I make a, I've made a promise to myself that after this conference, I will, I, will, I will feel better about this term. But my president, if she were here and she really wanted to be here, said to me, she, she knows that one of my pet peeves, I, I don't like buzzwords. Um, and prior to this conference, prior to this conference, move the needle was one of those buzzwords for me. Everybody wants to move the needle and move the needle. And I'm like, okay, but how? Okay, but when? Okay, but what needle? And how are we gonna move? And I'm afraid of needles. So, you know, <laughs> the whole phrase comes at a certain, certain context for me. Um, but so many people in higher education nowadays wanna move the needle and kick the tires and, you know, um, up the ante. And I just don't know what we're talking about anymore. And at the end of it, we, ha we have these words have to matter. They have to be things that we can actually do. Now, when I reconcile and decide that I'm going to embrace the term move the needle, I actually think if we um, have honest conversation about it and what we mean and clarity and intentionality about our metrics and our goals, we actually can use this as a good metaphor for where we're headed. That is, you think about the um, speedometer in your car and or even the data that was presented today as if it were the speedometer in your car. In higher education at most campuses, we have reached a certain speed, whether it's 45 on your campus or 55 or you know 75. Some, we're, at a di we're at different speeds and velocities. But for most of us, we're at that place where we're sort of coasting. Things, you know, our institutions will exist. We may not be the best. We may have to do more with less, but we're, we're existing. Moving the needle says we're going to try to move beyond our average, uh, beyond our mean, to see something different, or a different result, or a different velocity, a different pace. And we have to figure out what our strategy is for doing that. That's why we're here at this gathering today, is to figure out what we want to do um, to really move the needle, what we want to do to move su uh, the, success, the needle on student success. Now, my way of opening conversations in a way about student success is to really help us think about why we exist. All of us exist, whether we are two-year, four-year, uh, Florida-based, Tennessee-based, Oregon-based campuses. All of us exist, believe it or not, because we are trying to educate students to get jobs. Okay, yes, I'm not moving on until we all agree, right? <laughs> And anybody, anyone who does this is gonna delay me on this slide. No, we, we do. And here's what I say to folks who are like, well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, is, is at the end of this experience, I've been so many, I'm blessed to have been to lots of campuses, um, and I counted a privilege to have had that opportunity. But one thing I've taken from, and I've taken lots of things from those experiences on those campuses, one thing I've taken from those experiences is whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or in the South, Southeast, Northeast, two year, four year, historically black, Hispanic serving, predominantly white, campus, online campus, offline campus, um, you know, I don't even know all the different monikers for our institutions anymore, but I mean, if, regardless of your classification, every single one of us are training students who at the end of it believe that this degree better lead to a job. If the degree does not lead to a job, it has failed. 
There is not a single student who goes to a class. This is a great facility. And, and students would love to have, I would love to have a class in this room. But if what's the purpose of having a class in a facility that's this remarkable and well laid out or acquainted, and at the end of it, all I can do is hold a piece of paper and get no job whatsoever, especially in a society like ours, which is um, you know commerce based. It's a it's a it's a society where you are judged by what you do. It's why people, when we meet each other, we say, "Hey, what's your name?" Our next question is, what do you do? No one ever says, what size shoe do you wear? <laughs> hey, what's your name? Oh my gosh, you know, do you like to mow the lawn? What's your hobby? No one says that. We get to it eventually, but we are preoccupied in this society given its structure and the fact that we know that, um, you know, I was sitting in the car with a student on my campus the other night and he said to me something like, um, you know, Growing up, I had no idea what people meant when they said this, but money really does make the world go round. And he was talking about all his financial problems. He needs money for gas. He needs money to pay his phone bills. I mean, these are major, major financial problems for him, for him, which is true. Part of the care and the communities of care that we're trying to build is to help us understand that that experience for that student is real. And it's enough to compromise all of our efforts at keeping him, in stu him or her or them in school. So, um, you know, building these communities of care really requires to understand that what we are doing, that's why I fundamentally believe that what we're doing in higher education is social justice work. It is. I don't say that to be, um, to, to insist that you necessarily have to see it that way, but we are creating opportunities for people, quite frankly, to matter in society. We're giving them the education they need to go on and assume the jobs that they rightfully deserve that will lead to and allow them to uh, matter in this society, to have respectable jobs and respectable incomes and to be able to do things that this society judges as important, like have a job, you know, maybe get a car, have a place to live, um, pay their bills, and when we don't create these opportunities or when our efforts fail or when our communities are not caring and supportive to all folks, we create inequities that perpetuate systematic disparities for certain communities in society. That's what we do, not, not maybe not individually, but collectively, when we don't create pathways to our campuses for all students, when we don't make sure that students who are fighting food insecurities have access to uh, food shelters and food pantries in order to get the, their, what they need. By the way, the word care, which is the part of a theme, care and innovation, the word care is defined as the provision of what is necessary for life and health, <clears throat> and welfare, and maintenance, and protection of someone or something. So when we start to really help students um, get their degrees, it's not only to get a job, it's really providing them a pathway to um, well-being and, and, and good life. And so when you start asking students, you know, well, Students come to our campuses in order to get jobs, but they get these jobs from employers. Employers want our students to possess certain skills. Shown on the screen are just nine of them. I only want to call out one for your attention, although I see people taking pictures, feel free. I mean, I, I would use these as like learning outcomes in a class. I would think about them as uh, institutional learning outcomes and strategic plans. That is, students who come to our institutions at the end of two years or four years um, or whatever the term or the time for their degree or certificate uh, credential is, should be able to demonstrate that they know how to work on diverse teams. If you've ever heard me say this or speak to students, when I'm speaking to students, what I say to students is, all right, everybody get up and go sit beside someone who you've never met. I know you're probably sitting beside friends or people in your major or people who you have classes with I'm gonna give you a few minutes to get up and go sit beside someone who you've never talked to. I encourage you to find people about whom you hold some negative stereotypes and, and beliefs. And if you've never, if you have no idea what it's like to sit beside a tall person, go find a tall person and get it out of your system now. 
Why? Because to me, higher education, our campuses become the training ground for students to get the skills that they need to possess in order to secure the job they want. This is their training ground today for their tomorrow. And what students do when they come into wonderful spaces like this or a classroom or study hall or a computer lab or an advising center or a cafeteria and they keep sitting beside the same people, what they're really doing is robbing themselves of the learning opportunities that they need to develop the comp cultural competence that's necessary for them to succeed in the job they're gonna secure when they graduate. Say it again, when they hang around the same people and never meet people who are different from themselves, they're robbing themselves of the necessary learning opportunities they must have to develop the cultural competence that will make them the dynamite CEO or social worker or teacher or pastor or minister or rapper, which is clearly what I must do for a living, <laughs> according to most people who see me in airports because stereotypes are real, right? Um, so when, when they do this, uh, they rob themselves of these spirits. But now listen, when left to their own devices, most people, I didn't say students, most people hang around people who are like themselves. So I think it's really interesting when people read the belonging book and, and, and lots of different, they, they, we leave thinking that students are the special species of, of individuals or humans who behave in a certain way that none of us ever behaved in. <clears throat> but if I did a poll right now, I probably would find that most of us in this room are sitting beside people who we work with, sitting beside people who are in our office, for the different institutions that are in the room, we're probably sitting by institution. And there are no signs that say, hey, everybody from Oregon over here, everybody from Tennessee over here, everybody from Seminole over here, everybody from Midtown over here and downtown. No, it's not like that. But when left to our own devices, we do it. It is human behavior, what psychologists called uh, homophily. It's like the, uh, the, the connection with the same um, because Consciously or subconsciously, we assume that if I go sit beside people who are like me, I'm going to be more at home. When actually, you might be more alike and share more in common with people who you've never met. But without intervention, that is, hey, everybody get up and go move seats and sit beside someone who's different, or everybody pair off and go sit beside the number that's that similar numbers, students will not, they'll, they'll deny themselves these learning opportunities are necessary. The reason why I want to point out that we do it too is because I know that in the audience are presidents and provosts and deans and directors and coordinators. And let me tell you, I was sitting in my uh, and I wasn't sitting in my classroom, so I don't have a classroom, but I was, I was in a classroom on my campus one day, and I witnessed that the same way in which our students need cultural competence in order to get the job that they want, we need cultural competence skills in order to teach in classrooms with diverse learners. I observed a student who was telling a story about um, you know, she works at a fast food place and she was trying to tell folks what was going on in, at the fast food uh, line when someone gave her a counterfeit bill. And, she, you know, the person gave her the money and she used it, uh, put it in the cash register. At the end of the night, her manager came and checked the drawer and said, this is counterfeit. Who accepted this? And she said, I don't know. I mean, I was on the register. And her manager said, you know, banged on the table and said, what in the world? Why would you accept this counterfeit bill? And she said, how would I know it's counterfeit? And she said, did you use the marker? She said, what marker? She said, the marker. Didn't someone teach you to use the marker? And she showed her how to use the marker. You know, the counterfeit marker I'm talking about. Showed her how to use She said, no. No one ever taught me how to do that. And before you know it, um, she had gone to the story. Other students in the classroom were talking about this experience thing happening with them. But because she was sort of banging on the table and being energetic to tell this fascinating story, I was, I was at the edge of my seat like, oh, don't stop. But before you know it, the instructor stopped her and said, first of all, you need to calm down. And then said, get up and leave. Because the instructor experienced that moment where the student was being hostile and belligerent and angry 
and threatening. Have you ever been sitting in the middle of something and it's like you just, you must have like gone to sleep because you don't know what just happened. You have no idea. I'm like, no, I was, don't stop the story. I want to hear this. But, it, but I realized that, and I ended up having to have a meeting to bring the student, the instructor, and folks together to say to the student and the instructor that where the student's from, I bet people tell stories that way. I bet people get really animated and excited and people are really, you know, dramatic and like to, you know, illustrate for you the moment so you can relive it with them. But, and, and the goal in that moment is to restructure the moment so that people really feel it. But if you're not from that experience, then you might see that and see that as disorderly and attach different words to it. The challenge is, in this case, one person had the power to dismiss the other, and the other only had the power to deal with the consequences of it. Fortunately, the forces collided that day that I was present in the room so that I could help us through that moment. But how many students find themselves in moments like these in our classrooms? And guess what? We went after them. We, we sent the, 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 the brochure to their communities. We built the website to get them to come to our campus. We even invested resources in a new recruiter and gave them the zip code to go down or go over or go up and find those students and tell them we want them here. And now we have them here and they're not like us and they don't talk like us and they don't act like us, but we have not yet changed to accommodate the new learner. That learner, the way they learn, the way they think about the world is always penalized in this space. So it's important for us as we think about this to think about what we're trying to do is build, yes, evidence-based cultures in communities of care, but caring starts not with a hug, doesn't start with a high five. Caring actually starts in our mind. Organizational mindsets as well as individual mindsets. And we have to be willing to move the needle. We have to be willing to change. To think that the needle will move with us doing the exact same thing that we've always done and thinking that by coming to a conference called Move the Needle and then getting a badge and some good coffee, and it is good coffee, um, and, then, and then going back to our campus, things will change. That's not going to change it. What we've got to do is we've got to go back. And by the way, I'm talking directly to people who are responsible for academic units. You've got to go back and do exactly what the forces of life left me to do that day. If you have not been in a classroom recently, Talk to your assistant and tell them, I want to go in classrooms. I don't need to teach, I just want to observe. I want to see what happens in our classrooms. If you haven't talked to your faculty about cultural competency and cultural mindsets and thinking differently about learning, then put it on the agenda for the next faculty assembly. If you're not comfortable facilitating that conversation, that's not an indictment. Everybody's not able to have that conversation. I told my president about that moment, and my president said, I'm so glad you're here, because there's no way in the world she could have facilitated that conversation. She's a wonderful leader, but that's not what she's, uh, that's not her space where she works regularly. Because what it took was language to say to the student, like, to affirm the student's way of knowing, epistemology, that without my intervention would be demonized as um, not appropriate, not academic, um, not orderly, to affirm it. And then to come back and help the faculty member restructure that moment. How can we look back at that moment and think about what could have been done differently? What can we do? to make sure that all of our faculty are equipped with the skills they need to understand. Sometimes a student might bang on the table, it's just out of excitement. Because have you ever banged on the table out of excitement? And even if you haven't, I gotta tell you, if I bang on the table, it's usually out of excitement. I get excited when I start thinking about our work. Especially when I know that if we do some of the things we're talking about intentionally and with strategy and with heart and passion, we could truly move the needle. That when students really are, <coughs> excuse me, educated in ways that give them these kinds of skills, they will get good jobs. Now, interestingly enough, to move down the road a bit further, students will want to get jobs. To get jobs today, most students who leave our institutions do not acquire a job that squarely aligns with their major. 
We are educating students today who will get degrees in all sorts of areas, stackable credentials, and they will go off and get jobs, one that didn't exist five to seven years ago. Right now, you have graduates of your institutions. I have graduates of my own, too. We have graduates who go on and get jobs in um, you know, all sorts of industries and skills that we have not really thought about yet on all of our campuses. So on my own, I live in Memphis. Our, my campus is based in Memphis. One of the things we know about Memphis is Memphis is one of the country's major hubs for um, logistics jobs. Shouldn't say this probably, but we have no degree in logistics. What a missed opportunity. But you know why we have no logistics degree? This is not a critique of my faculty because I love my faculty, but it's because faculty, when left to their own devices, do what faculty do, and that is we teach. And I've, I've, if I didn't teach it last year, I'm not gonna teach it next year unless you tell me to teach it next year um, because I've already prepped that class. And if I do a new prep, it's gonna be something based on my new book or my latest uh, pro project or publication or whatever. But you know, mapping the curriculum onto the job market in the local or regional economy is something that I think all of us who count ourselves as administrators ought to be thinking about. That outlook, that environmental scan should be going on. What are the industries that are really uh, popping, for lack of a better word, in your area? And then what, is the, what are the degrees, certificates that are being offered right now from your institution to, to equip students for those jobs? If you see uh, empty markets, that is there are jobs available and we provide no degrees, then how do you facilitate the conversation amongst the faculty and the academic leaders to start thinking about creation of new degrees and certificates and programs? By the way, students don't only come to our campuses for full degrees. This is like preaching to the choir, but if you know anything about me, I'm a choir director. And what I know about choirs is every now and again, you gotta remind them of the lyrics and remind them of the song because they don't remember stuff. And so we gotta remember that everything doesn't have to be a two-year degree or a four-year degree. Sometimes people just need certificates. There are lots of companies in this. I was on a, at a, a tech conference on the West Coast speaking a few months ago, and there were all these big businesses there, Amazon and Google and Yahoo and all of them. Um, and they were talking about the fact that what they actually need beyond what we're talking about right now, and that is students who have these solid skills, not you know specialized skills, but you know, because Yahoo and Google and in my state, you know, Cummings and FedEx and where am I now? Or Florida, so Disney, they can teach people the specialized technologies, software those skills. What they all have said time and time again in every business magazine is there's some stuff we simply can't teach. We can't teach them overnight how to be good writers. We have not proven how to, we can't teach them in a on the job kind of training or workshop how to be critical thinkers. We can't, it turns out we can't teach them how to solve problems and a lot of them come to the company ready to identify all the problems. Don't like this, don't like that, don't like my office, don't like you. Um, but you know, don't know how to then map that onto a strategy for solving those problems. That's exciting for me because I think that is what we do well in higher education. I think that is what my faculty colleagues do well, is that we know how to structure and scaffold learning so that students learn how to face a problem, dissect a problem, and break it down to its various elements, and then to figure out what will I do to solve it, and now how do I prioritize those steps into a full-fledged plan that I can then execute to take care of this problem. We can teach that and coach that and rehearse that through the curriculum. Now the question is, are are we doing it? Does our curriculum do that? What are the learning outcomes associated with our curriculum? What are the outcomes and the uh, associated with our programs? And how do our program outcomes really map onto the courses? And that takes time. So for the you know senior leaders in the room, I'm not asking you unless you're a one person shop and it, you know that if you took this idea back to your campus, it's gonna be you who does it, and then more power to you. We are all here to support you as a community of care. But if you are not the person to do it, what we often need senior level folks is to give the charge and then to, to devote the resources. Quite often that's the time, the money, the new staff person, part-time, full-time, who will take care of this, and, and then, um, to provide this, the space where people will come together 
and think through, okay, what are our courses and what are the outcomes and how do they really map on to those larger outcomes on the last slide and as well as the career opportunities, job opportunities in our local economy. Well, that's going back the wrong way. Um, so we, when we think about all this, we know a lot about college students. As I said earlier, about a third of college students today identify as first generation. We got a lot of colleges. We have a lot of students, 21 million or more. Most of our students are educated at two-year community colleges. Two-year community colleges are not only wonderful um, sites of access for all, all students. I mean, I know first generation students of color, students living with disabilities, uh, single moms, single dads, who all start their post-secondary career at two-year community colleges. Tracking these folks over time, I know they're doing good work, important work, um, all across the country. Many of these students come to two-year colleges and want to go to a four-year school after they're done. In fact, let me pause for a moment and backtrack because the, the literature is sort of silent on this a bit. We have a lot of students who come to two-year colleges never thinking about a four-year degree. But after that first semester or first year of doing well at a two-year college, they start saying, wait a minute, I think I might be college material. And what we do at two-year community colleges is not only social justice work because it helps them create the opportunities for new jobs and bright futures, but it's also doing the, the efficacy work, building their confidence and their self-esteem. Some students in interviews have told me time and time again that what they experience at our colleges you know, is undoing negative messages about their academic efficacy, their academic confidence, stuff that they suffered in K-12. You know, teachers back in second grade and fourth grade and 10th grade who told them they're not going to college or they're not good at math or they're not good writers. And then they get to our campus, do well, connect meaningfully with one of our instructors or one of our staff members in the tutoring center, the writing center, or the one-stop shop, one-stop uh, program. And before you know it, they start feeling good about themselves. And that, by the way, cannot be um, diminished. The, the power of academic efficacy, we'll see this by the end, confidence um, to create success for students. So when we start doing this, many students come to two-year schools, they never thought about a four-year degree, they do well the first year or two, first semester or two, and before you know it, now they're thinking about a four-year degree. We have the strengthened pipelines and pathways to those degrees. Still today, about less than 25% of students who start at community colleges actually end up transferring to a four-year school and completing. Now, that's completing lots of students. And you're, 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 if you're in the vicinity of a four-year school and you have a strong articulation agreement, clearly those data won't uh, reflect your particular situation, but we have to make sure that we uh, not only build pathways to get people on the campus, but pathway to degrees. I like to tell people, access without success is useless. It's great to be at SPC again, but if you're a student, what's the point of coming here if you don't graduate? I know we're not all at SPC, so I tell students all the time, it's great. I, students, oh gosh, I, I love the library at our campus. I say, have you ever gone? No, I've never been there, but I mean, it's a really nice looking building. <laughs> or students at research universities, I say, well, great, it's a great research university, but have you ever done undergraduate research? No. Why are you at a research university and not doing research? Why are you at a campus that provides you access to musicians and, and artists and, and have all sorts of uh, cultural events and you don't go to any of them? It's really about maximizing that experience and taking up the whole experience that I think we're trying to create. But some of our planning is pretty short-sighted. We think about access to our campuses, but not keeping our mind focused on success. When I first arrived at my campus, people would tell me we are enrollment-driven. And how many of you in here are at enrollment-driven institutions? Enrollment-driven. So join me here in trying to change the discourse. I hope that none of us think of ourselves as enrollment-driven. Because when we think about enrollment driven, that is, that is a, I mean, I understand that's a term that is often used, but what that, and I think people who work in fiscal, they should keep that term. You know, we, we're enrollment driven. But for those of us who are in other areas like academic affairs or student affairs or um, any other area on the campus, we should not be talking about being enrollment driven. We should be success driven. Because enrollment says get them here. Get them to enroll get them to validate, pay their fees, and once they pay their fees, it's like, yes, okay, they pay their fees. All right, done. What's the next group we gotta enroll? And no one pays attention to the quality of their experience, their perceptions of the campus and that experience, as well as do they actually earn their degree. But when we are long-term focused and success focused, we're always thinking about do they actually earn their degree and do they graduate? 
Um, this is what a student success model looks like according to most uh, you know, past research. This is Vince Pinto's model back in the 70s. He revised it in the 90s. What we learned is that simply doesn't work. No one lives in boxes like that. You can't compartmentalize students' lives like that. What we really needed for a long time is a, a model that really takes into account the complexity of students' experiences. The fact that some students feel connected, some students feel alienated on our campus. That is, to me, what my belonging research allowed me to do. It's not like I ever thought of it as a student success model initially. I thought of it as a finding from my research. Um, I'm excited that the book is uh, you know, taken up by people in the field and being used in many different ways. What I do in the book is I offer this sort of model on belonging. I ground my work on belonging and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I say this, Maslow says as humans, we all have basic needs like air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and sex. Maslow said it, not me, don't judge. Um, <laughs> But you should get some, and I'm talking about air and food, clearly, um, because if you don't, higher order needs cannot emerge like safety and security or love and belongingness. And interestingly enough, everything that if you go to your institutional mission statement and map it onto my model, much of what you're doing, much of what we're doing in higher education, the skills we're trying to develop, the students we're trying to grow, the lifelong learners who are global citizens who um, create new knowledge, all of that is at the apex of that triangle. Self-actualization and creativity and spontaneity, that's the apex. That's our educational mission, as it were. Um, right here in this triangle, but most of us start down here. When students come to us, they come to us bringing whatever they have. They bring their problems, their complications, their charted histories. Let me tell you, I was sitting in my office the other day, sitting across from a student who started talking to me about the fact that um, he remembers, he keenly remembers his mom changing who his dad was. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I know you know, who my dad is, but one day my mom came to me, she was dating my dad, and then they broke up, and then she said, this is your dad. I was about four years old, five years old. He said, I remember this. And so all my life, I've grown up with this guy, but I, I find myself thinking about the other guy, because I don't look like this guy, but I look like the original guy. This is what a student told his vice president the other day in my office. And I'm looking at my job description, trying to figure out where does this fit? JK, I'm really not. But you ever had these moments where you're sitting here like, wow. Now, I've written all the time about how colleges and universities are microcosms of the greater society. Many of us are called upon to be surrogate parents and surrogate family for our students. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I see lots of nods. So I know I'm in the right space that some of us already know. We're going to be their auntie. We're going to be their uncle. We're going to be their cousin. We're going to be their mama, their dad, whatever it is. And, and I wrote that before I ever had the experience of that. And let me tell you, just like my cousins who fall on hard times and call me and say, can I borrow $100, I don't get to say to them, you know what, we only second cousins. <laughs> the same way I can't tell my cousin that because I'm still family for them is the same thing that compelled me to sit there at the desk, delay the meeting so I could hear the student tell me what he was sorting through because it matters. He's sorting through a question that lots of students between the ages of 17 and about 25 are sorting through. Some do it again later, but that is, who in the world am I? It's just a developmental process. And part of that, who am I, is like, who am I like? And you start looking at folks and saying, well, I know that's, I'm not like him. I'm like the other guy. I wonder where the other guy, and he says, you know, so I went to Facebook and I looked him up and I saw him. And I wanted to reach out to him, but my mom would kill me. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out how many of my faculty know that there are students in their classrooms who are listening to lectures and videos sorting through questions like that. How many of my faculty know that sometimes students come to the door, break down into tears because of stuff like that, and need to run to the restroom to get themselves together, and then when they have the confidence back to sort of come into the classroom and sit down and maybe they don't have their notebook anymore, maybe they left their pen in the car. How many of our faculty are, have the mindset of care and innovation, creative thinking to understand that um, a zero tolerance policy may not be appropriate for all experiences when we're trying to foster student success and we're trying to build communities where students feel like they belong. It's hard to feel like you belong where no one understands what your life is like. That's what I took from that moment with that student. 
Well, the only thing that stands between where we began with students and where we want to go with students is love and belongingness. But sense of belonging really does matter that much. It's this feeling that people matter to one another and to the group. And it's also this shared faith, faith. I'm a man of faith, and it took me some time to figure out what exactly we mean when we start talking about faith in a belonging sense. But a few years ago, I was on a campus. I talk about this in the book. Um, I was on a campus, uh, SUNY Binghamton, and I got this email from a student who said, uh, hey, Dr. Strayhorn, I need your help. And whatever he was asking for my help with, it had to do with like moving into the residence hall early. I don't work in housing. I've never worked in housing. In fact, I, I'd have, housing's nowhere on my resume. Um, I, didn't, I, was, I was never a GA in housing. I don't even think I took a course in housing. So for him to ask me a housing question or a resident, I was an RA, maybe that's why. But the student asked me a question. I'm thinking to myself, why in the world are you asking me this question? Why not ask the director of housing? He said, because I don't know the director of housing. I know you. I said, yeah, but how did you get my name? Like, I, am I, I honestly thought my name was on some bathroom wall on campus that said, hey, want to move in early contact Strayhorn? Because if so, then we're going to have to get maintenance to remove it. He said to me something really powerful. He said, no. He said, don't you remember when me and my mom came to visit the campus during the uh, aspiring students weekend? You were the keynote speaker. At the end of your talk, I'll never forget it, you said, if there's ever anything I can do for you. <laughs> So there is something you can do for me. You can help me move in early. <laughs> now, if I had responded to that student and said, listen, I am you know, professor of urban ed and I do not do, then I would have failed. We would have failed. But what he helped me realize is that students and their families are listening to us. They're listening to our websites. They're paying attention to the brochure. They're paying attention to the data. They're listening to our words. They're looking at the signs. And when we put signs on the wall that say things like, you matter, we care about you. Mattering has four dimensions to it, ego extension, importance, dependence, attention. Students feel like they belong when they feel like they matter. And they feel like they matter when they are educated, and you heard it on the video, it was so powerful, when they're educated in campuses and spaces that send the cue or a message that you matter to us, I care about you. I was, I'm sorry to keep using my, my own campus, but that's because I can talk about my own campus. I don't want to talk about yours. Um, that would be unpolite, and I'm from the South, and so um, impolite. And so I was in a building like this. Well, I wasn't like this. I was in a, in a building on my campus. And I was meeting with my faculty, and, but it was dark like this, and I thought, you know, I wear glasses, and I have really bad vision. I thought, could someone turn the lights on? And they said, the lights are on. And I said, but why is it so dark? And they said, oh, because those lights are out. And I counted that day. There were 12 lights out in this room. And I stopped in the middle of a really important meeting that had nothing to do with belonging or student success. And I said to folks, we got to change this. This can't happen. Because when a student sits in a classroom where the lights are out, not because we turned them off, but because they don't work, the message that they make of that, it didn't, doesn't, incidents on their own don't issue meaning. If I walk up to you and go, ah, you have no idea why I did that. It could have been like I was joking. It could have been I could have been trying to signal. It could be a different language you know nothing about. It's only when you grab that incident and make meaning of it. You interpret it for yourself. When students come into spaces, look at lights being out, what most students say is all, the lights are always out. These lights have been out since last year. You know why they're out? Because they don't care about us. When students come into spaces and they're broke down chairs, and I know I should say broken chairs, but really the way students say it is broke down. That chair is broke down. It's been broke down. When the, when the, pro, when the projector doesn't work or we're not prepared or when students go to campuses or are educated at campuses where bad things happen to LGBTQIA students and it doesn't get the attention of the administration, we don't speak out against these kinds of infractions that happen in the student body, that we don't enact policies that protect the safety of all students, regardless of their identity. The meaning that they make of it is, I don't matter. People don't care about me. Look what happened and they didn't even say a thing. And I know, enormous responsibility for those of us in senior leadership, but our voices matter a lot, especially on those matters. It's why when, when racism happens on our campus, we must speak out against it and speak loudly in written and in oral form. And when we have the town hall, hall form to discuss the incident that happened on campus, the president must be present. The vice presidents must be present. Not just the vice president of student affairs, I'll clap for myself on that 
but it's got to be all of us. Why? Because there's a student in the room who's waiting for you to be there, and your presence and your voice is the one that will signal to them, you know what, they do care about Muslim students. You know what, they actually do care about uh, students living with disabilities. When we do not provide ramps for students, retrofit buildings so that students can access spaces, the meaning that they make of it is, I don't have their attention, they don't care about me, I do not matter. And the reason why that's um, so problematic is without intervention, that is without something changing, that just cascades and it becomes they don't care about me, people like me don't matter, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. If I left, they would never even recognize it. I may as well go home today if not tomorrow. And then the student leaves. Belonging has shown up time and time again in my research as mattering. Looks like this on a building. Looks like this on a website. So I think what we're trying to do is figure out how can we together, theme of the conference, create more value together, systematically through communities of care. Um, how do we make sure that what we do is student-centered, right? So I, I strive every day in my work to be student-centered. Doesn't mean I'm not a faculty advocate. I have to be as the vice president of academic affairs and as a former faculty member, current faculty member. I, I think faculty are really, really important. But when I start thinking about what, we, what, what, what drives us, it's actually student success at the center that drives all of our initiatives and our strategies. Right now we're making an, a major investment in our student center. It is because I believe that students need space that's comfortable to mingle. I was walking through our student center one day, saw some students in really uncomfortable chairs and asked them, hey, what are you doing? They said, we're doing our homework. I said, are you comfortable? They said, do we look comfortable? I said, no, you don't. I said, we got to get you better chairs. What kind of chairs do you want before you know it? They said, well, if we had, you know, chairs with lots of plugs so we can plug in all of our gadgets. And then they started naming other institutions that have these chairs. I was a newcomer to Memphis, so I didn't know these campuses. But what I did one night, my day ended like 7, 8 o'clock at night. I got in my car, and rather than going home, I drove to those campuses. And I went to their student center, and I just walked through. And I took pictures of the chairs that looked cool and comfortable and the plugs. And then I called a meeting because I could with the folks who were in maintenance and the folks who were in fiscal and the folks in my area and the folks in student affairs and said, put the PowerPoint together and said, here are the chairs that look really comfortable at unnamed institution. I'm not trying to be that institution. I want us to be us, but can we have cool chairs for our students? And we got to price it out. And now we got to figure out what's the way to fund these things. And then when we do it, we're not going to say we're doing a building renewal. We're not doing um, facilities. We're doing student success work. Because guess what? When you put good chairs in comfortable spaces with lots of plugs, you're fostering belonging. You're fostering student success. You're increasing retention. You are moving the needle. That is moving the needle. When you start doing that, when you track those kind of changes onto changes in the experiences of students, I think that's exciting. By the way, you start banging on tables because you get excited about it, right? All right, so I want to stop by just highlighting, this is what uh, Cornell University has. By the way, these screenshots are not only in my slides, some of them are in the book. Um, Cornell University says, you know, students come to our campuses with all sorts of questions. And the questions that students have are not unique to themselves. Lots of people have them like, where do I get my ID? How do I get a parking pass dismissed? All those kinds of questions. Um, and students have so many questions, they don't know who to go to. And it's really hard to feel like you belong in a place where you just, you feel out of place. You don't know where to turn to. You have no sort of navigational system. So Cornell has this website called Ask Ezra. It's really cool. It looks like a library website, but actually you go here and you type a question like, where can I find my grades? Or where can I, I don't know, find tutoring? And then um, for questions that have been uh, sent in the past, the answer pops up. It's that kind of system. But for new questions, there are volunteer writers who respond to your questions, and then those responses are archived. So the system's made dynamic this way. I can tell you the cost of building this was minimal. It's on an existing website, it's the creation of a new site, it's the marketing and messaging around this site, but talk about helping students find answers to questions. 
Now, Ezra is their namesake, Ezra Cornell. You don't have to call it Ask Ezra. It could be Ask Whatever on your campus. But these kind of websites really help students feel that sense of belonging, get their answers question, uh, their questions answered, and also find success. The last is this. I often use this in research, having students uh, go through this, this attributional retraining. Students defeat themselves. A lot of time, I told you, it starts in your mind. Defeat themselves with these messages about inadequacy and not feeling like they are enough. It's really powerful. In fact, students who follow me on Instagram, they like this post a lot, and then they'll share with me what they do with it. Sometimes there are students in this country right now who wake up in the morning, look at their mirror, and on their mirror are these four lines where they look in the mirror and say, I matter. I am enough. I'm here on purpose. I belong here. These words are more than just semantics, though. Imagine the power of that recitation in your morning and then you enter a campus where everything on campus sends the message that you, you were, that you do matter. Another quick example, I was on a campus one time for a student conference. The student arrived with me, I was the speaker, they were a student at the conference, they got to the table where we were supposed to pick up name badges, mine's over, oh, that's right here, um, name badges. And the student walked up to the table and she said, oh, they have name badges for us. I said, yeah. She said, but they're printed. I said, I said, what is that doing for you? She said, that means they like prepared for us. Simple. Belonging, simple. Simply showing up to class. You heard it earlier from Dr. Uh, Dr. Pinker that um, knowing their name versus, hey, you in the red shirt. Sometimes it might start there, but if we end there, then that's a problem. But moving the needle is starting to build cultures where we know students by their names and the strategies and our policies and our programs signal that they matter. I would be, not me, if I didn't close my favorite way, and that is to bring it back to the sensories. Shown on the screen right now is my maternal grandmother, Creola Evelyn Warner. In many ways, everything that I know about life that I didn't learn from my research or in a classroom, I learned from my grandmother. Yesterday was a hard day for me on my own campus. Um, Sheriff Tashika was my, I expelled my first student. I expelled my first student for fighting. And it's hard to do the work of belonging and male student success and to have to kick a male out of school. But our work on care and innovation have to come together in a way that we're also maintaining our commitment to larger issues like safety insecurity. So when people say things like, oh my gosh, he's so exciting as a speaker, this is because this is more than a job for me, it's more than a talk for me, it's more, you know, I turned to my own model yesterday to find strength because it's safety and security that Maslow said is important. And although the person might be a Rhodes Scholar or a winning athlete or the head of a club or organization, Safety and security are that fundamentally important. That we have to make sure that, as my grandmother used to tell me, she said, baby, you gotta make sure that what you say matters. And we said it in our student handbook that we had a zero tolerance policy on fighting. So although I was torn all over the place yesterday, I knew when I sort of thought through it and looked at the policies and thought about what I had to do, I knew what decision had to be made. I knew what decision I had to stand beside. Well, it was my grandmother who one day said to me, you know, baby, you know, listen, um, there's gonna be some days in life that are not gonna, you know, most days are really good days for me. But she said, some days are not gonna be so exciting. You're gonna have some really, some dark days, some sad days, and I was like, I was like six. So I was thinking, I'm not gonna, no, not me. It's just lollipops and candy, you know, drops all the time. My grandmother would tell me all the time, baby, keep on living, and you would encounter those kind of days. I remember yesterday, think about my grandmother, because that was that kind of day for me. 
My grandmother was a choir director. I'm a choir director. I remember one time my grandmother was at this church, and they had surprised her. They said, Miss Warner, we want you to come up and sing a song. My grandmother came up and sang this song. I never, ever will forget it. The words of the song are, uh, there's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side somewhere. Don't you give up until you find it. There's a bright side somewhere. My grandmother was, she tinkled at the piano, not a whole lot of playing, but she would sing far better than she could play. And she stood up in front of this church. She said, I'm going to do this song acapulco. That is not what's supposed to be said. It's supposed to be acapella. But that's my grandmother, so don't judge. And so she said acapulco. And she got in front of that church. She said, there's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side somewhere. Don't you give up until you find. There's a bright side somewhere. Last night I landed, I went to the courtyard Marriott. I was gonna go to bed, but I was too frustrated from my day. So I don't know, midnight, one o'clock, I got up and I went walking along the water because my grandmother said, you don't give up until you find it. And I kept walking and thinking through my day until I found the bright side. I gotta tell you, you are my bright side. Because I knew that I could share with you today that we're doing important work. We create opportunities, we remove disparities, we open pathways for students and families and communities. There's no better, greater profession in the world, in my opinion, than the one that we are engaged in. Each day when we do our work well, we get to not only move the needle, we get to move the country in ways that it cannot imagine. This conference is more than just a gathering of like-minded people. It's an opportunity for us to come together and not only learn strategies, but remember this, to go back and know what care looks like and what it feels like. I want to leave you not just with data and theory. I want to leave you with a feeling because my grandmother, on November 17, 2013, at Craven County Hospital after suffering an aneurysm, left me with that feeling. I said to my mom, who's a public health nurse, said, mom, go home. I'm going to take care of grandma tonight. I had no idea what was about to transpire. I slept beside my grandmother, my grandmother in the bed, me in a chair. I held her hand throughout the night. I woke up at 1.17 a.m. to my grandmother shaking my hand. She had not talked in two weeks. She was a public school teacher for 53 years. When they would ask her, Miss Warner, what day of the week is it? She'd just sit there with no answer. Miss Warner, who's president of the United States? This was during the time of President Obama, and I know she voted for him. She didn't know his name. My grandmother only has one child. That's my mom, her name is Linda. They say, Miss Warner, what's your daughter's name? And she just sit there and look so confused and just start crying sometimes because she was so frustrated because she didn't have activity of her own limbs. That night, November 17, 2013, after not speaking for two weeks but yet holding her hand, staying close to her, caring for her, I washed her hair, I cleaned her diapers, I took care of my grandmother because she took care of me my entire life. And at 1.17 a.m., she gave me the best gift any grandma could ever give me. She woke me up, shaking my hand. I looked at her and said, Mom, are you okay? She had not talked in two weeks, but she said, hey, baby, hey, Rail. I said, oh, she's talking. I tried to call the nurse. She said, uh-uh, uh-uh, baby, let's sing my favorite song. There's a bright side somewhere. Honey, you do the next verse. I said with tears in my eyes, there's a bright side somewhere. My grandma said, don't you give up. Until you find it. I said, Ma, let's do the next nine together. There's a bright side. And I realized at that moment my grandmother had transitioned. Doing what she loved. I pray for each and every one of you. Thank you. I pray for each and every one of you that all of us live that kind of life, that when we transition, whatever that is, by the way, synonym for the word transition, move, 
as we transition the needle, that we do it doing what we love. My grandmother would say to me, baby, what are these things you keep traveling the country giving all the time? I said, they're called keynotes. She said, uh-huh, I'm gonna get me one of them one day. <laughs> Folks, she never lived to give a keynote. She lived the better life to be the keynote. Thank you.